Two deadly fugitives are on the run from justice. Authorities follow an electronic trail and chase the escaped convict and his partner from state to state. The suspects are moving fast, determined to avoid capture. The police and the FBI must track them down before they take another life. Pennsylvania, an inmate escaped with the help of his female accomplice. Following a trail of fraudulent credit card receipts and death, authorities track the pair, but always find themselves one step behind. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The FBI and police race to capture the deadly couple, who seem to be running with no direction, no sense of fear, and nothing to lose. Investigation at September 25th, 1993. Friends of 74-year-old Guy Goodman contact the Palmyra, Pennsylvania police. They are concerned because they have not heard from him in over a week. Goodman's landlord meets an officer at his rented house. You have a key for the door there? I do. Okay, let's go check it out. Okay. You just want to step back there? All right. The officer observes shards of broken porcelain on the floor and dried blood on the floor and walls. Blood spatter trails down the hall and leads to the basement stairs. In a storage room, he discovers a body. The officer calls for assistance. Headquarters, code three, code three, requesting backup. Hi, are you clear? Oh. You don't want eight three three. Go ahead. Detective Paul Zeckman of the Lebanon County Detective Bureau takes the lead in the investigation. That's where I'm going. Ten four. I'll be en route to that location. The countywide bureau helps township police departments with major crime investigations. It was evident that the house had been ransacked. The kitchen drawers were open, things were strewn around on the floor. Going down into the basement area, you could see drag marks led from the uh, stairway uh, to a small storage room. The crime scene is gruesome. The victim's hands and feet are tied behind his back. Several layers of plastic bags, sheets, and blankets and shroud his head. Coverings are tightened at his neck with makeshift bindings. These items were either duct taped or tied with electrical cords. The plastic bag was duct taped over the cloth covering. Hoping to find a trace of the perpetrator, crime scene investigators carefully process the house. They dust every surface for latent fingerprints and collect a roll of duct tape left on a table, likely the same tape used in the bindings. With no witnesses, only the careful examination of every item can help the detectives understand this crime. 
we were trying to not only obtain the forensic evidence, but we were also trying to determine if any of the property was taken from the residence. We were able to establish that Mr. Goodman's wallet was missing. They find American Express charge statements. Oh. But the There's card American itself Express is missing. Statement here. The account numbers get that old. In the bedroom, investigators discover an open box of checks. A series of checks from the middle of this box had been removed. We also knew that the vehicle of Mr. Goodman was also missing at this point. What do you have to do out here yet? Guy Goodman seemed like an unlikely target for this type of attack. Like most of the Palmyra, Pennsylvania community, Chief Michael Wayman knew of the victim. Guy Goodman was a retired florist. He was a lifelong resident of the, of the Palmyra area, uh, well known within the community and liked by uh, everyone in the community. It was apparent that either the motive for this crime was a robbery that had gone bad or that there was a robbery after the fact, uh, after Mr. Goodman was assaulted and died. Palmyra, Pennsylvania is located in Lebanon County. This peaceful community sees fewer than three murders per year. In most cases, the victim knows the killer. At the autopsy, the victim's face is unrecognizable. The medical examiner uses dental records to confirm it is Guy Goodman. Based on the body's decomposition, he concludes Goodman has been dead for about a week. Although the victim was severely beaten, his wounds were not fatal. An examination of his respiratory tract reveals he died slowly from suffocation. Latent prints recovered from Goodman's house are processed at the lab. Examiners check the prints against local arrest records and find a match. When the forensics report arrives on Zekman's desk, he isn't surprised by the results. Fingerprints that we had obtained at the crime scene matched Bradley Martin. Zekman knows the name all too well. I just entered him as a wanted person charging him with the escape from the county prison, so I knew he was on the run. Many of Lebanon County's inmates are part of a work release program. Bradley Martin, a repeat thief and drug user, is one of these work release prisoners. Over a week earlier, Martin used a two-hour pass, a weekly perk of the work release program, to meet his new girlfriend, Carolyn King. 27-year-old King worked at a factory where she met the 21-year-old work release prisoner. When Martin failed to return, prison officials launched a fugitive investigation. They called the Lebanon County Detective Bureau. After obtaining a fugitive warrant for Martin, the detectives checked Carolyn King's apartment, concerned for her well-being. But King is not there, and they find nothing to indicate where she has gone, or even if she is with Martin. The detectives entered Martin in NCIC, the National Criminal Information Center. Once the murder of Guy Goodman is discovered, there is a greater urgency to find Martin than to determine if Carolyn King is unharmed. The detectives interview Martin's friends and co-workers. What they learn surprises them. Through interviews, we were able to establish that Bradley Martin and Carolyn King were together several days after Guy Goodman was murdered. We were able to establish that they were together in the Palmyra area, and then it was just blank. Detectives face the possibility that Carolyn King may be Martin's accomplice. Earlier, when Detective Zekman ran a statewide background check on King, she came up clean. He tries again, 
this time using a national database. He learns she has a long criminal history, including theft and check forgery. She has outstanding warrants for her arrest and is also a suspect in two murders in Virginia. The detectives have no idea where the two suspects are. If they left town right after the Goodman murder, they have more than a week's head start. Detectives hope to track the suspects using the American Express charge card and the checks stolen from the victim's home. Okay, let me call the guy at the American Express Security Department. That's great. Detective Wayman asks American Express Global Security in New York to help. Joe Gannon, the chief investigator in Amex Security, works to assist the police. And I'll be back to you as soon as I can. Got it. Thanks. We flagged Mr. Goodman's account because he was the victim of a homicide and the chances were that the perpetrators of that homicide were in possession of that card. A review of Goodman's account shows purchases made after Goodman's death. The transactions leave a trail that may lead to Goodman's killer. We discovered that the charges began in western Pennsylvania and continued out through the Ohio Valley, down into Iowa and Kansas, and then they turned north. And the last transaction we had on record was in Rapid City, South Dakota. Armed with a solid lead, the Pennsylvania detectives waste no time. They catch the next available flight to Rapid City, South Dakota. The killers had disappeared. But the victim's charge card had become the investigator's best informant. Police hope the trail of surfacing transactions will lead them to the murderers. Within hours, the Pennsylvania detectives arrive in Rapid City. Accompanied by local police, they visit the last stores where the charge card was used. Interviews with clerks verify their suspicions. Up until this point, we were speculating that Bradley Martin and Carolyn King were the two people that were using Goodman's American Express card. Then, investigators catch their first real break. Some of the individuals were able to identify Bradley Martin mm -hmm. as a user of the card. Some were able to identify Carolyn King as a user of the card. This one. The revelation confirms their theory. It was no longer a who done it. We knew for certain who had done it. Now it was a matter of changing the focus of the investigation as to apprehending them. The Pennsylvania detectives circulate photos of detailed information about the suspects to all South Dakota law enforcement agencies. The Rapid City Police Fraud Unit, or Bunko Squad, tells them of an interracial couple who've been passing bad checks at local stores. Rapid City Police Department had a black and white bunco team who were trying to do a con game within the area. It was a black female and a white male driving a vehicle with Virginia plates. We knew that this fit the description of Carolyn King and Bradley Martin. We knew that Carolyn King had a vehicle with Virginia plates. We felt that they were there working in the Rapid City area. The Pennsylvania detectives assist as Rapid City police pull over the couple in the car with Virginia plates. They confirm the couple is the team Rapid City detectives have been hunting, but not the suspected killers. The black female and the white male were in fact not Martin and King, they were just simply another couple that matched the description and who were doing their own criminal activities. American Express informs the detectives there have been no new charges in over a week. The investigation appears to be back at the beginning with no leads. But King and Martin are having trouble using their murder victims' out-of-state checks. Let me get my manager for you, ma'am. 
They need another source of cash. Their next victim, a 59-year-old woman traveling alone, Donna Martz. The terrified woman complies when they force her to take them to her car. The next day, the Pennsylvania detectives learn that someone passed several of Guy Goodman's checks in North Dakota. The bank had cleared checks written in a number of locations in the Bismarck, North Dakota area. This supports the detective's theory. They had used the credit card. Now they were utilizing the checks stolen from Guy Goodman at the time of his homicide that further validated that they had to have been the persons who committed the homicide. Detective Allender, please. Zeckman phones authorities in Bismarck from the road. I'm a Sergeant Zeckman from Lebanon County, Pennsylvania. I made contact with a detective within the Bismarck Police Department. Uh, I told him of uh, locations that I had had checks passed, and I gave him a rundown of the uh, Guy Goodman homicide and who was involved and uh, what evidence we had discovered up to this point. And there was a long pause uh, from the detective. And I asked him what was wrong, and he said, well, we're investigating a missing person from that same hotel where one of these Goodman checks were passed. Donna Martz's family called police when she did not return home from Bismarck. They described Martz as a Chrysler New Yorker. Police comb Bismarck for any sign of Martz or her car, but find nothing. The detectives fear Martin and King have grabbed Donna Martz. The case has a new urgency. A woman's life is at stake. Police investigate the death of 74-year-old retired florist Guy Goodman, who was severely beaten, then murdered in his rural Pennsylvania home. Investigators determined that the victim's charge card and a book of checks were stolen. Fingerprints at the scene identify two likely perpetrators, 21-year-old Bradley Martin and his 27-year-old girlfriend, Carolyn King. Pennsylvania detectives Paul Zeckman and Michael Wayman follow the pair of fugitives to Bismarck, North Dakota, and learn authorities there are investigating the disappearance of a woman from the same hotel where one of Goodman's checks was passed. Donna Martz, a traveling tour guide for an interstate bus line, was last seen at the hotel where the suspects were staying. When Martz didn't arrive home as scheduled, her family reported her missing. Local authorities issue an APB on Martz's Chrysler New Yorker. The Bismarck FBI joins the case, led by Special Agent Craig Welker. The FBI and the North Dakota Bureau of Criminal Investigation uh, set up a task force which was joined by other agencies, including the Bismarck Police Department and the local sheriff's department. When the Pennsylvania detectives arrive in Bismarck, they share the information on the fugitives that they gathered over the past week. They uh, became an integral part of the task force on this case. The linking of King and Martin was very critical in the investigation. With potential suspects identified in the abduction of Donna Martz, the task force still struggles for viable leads. They continue to search the hotel. We spoke with the clerks at the uh, hotel in Bismarck where, where Donna Martz uh, was last seen. And they were able to tell us that Bradley Martin and Carolyn King had stayed at the same hotel. 
Hotel okay. personnel also recall that around 9 a.m. on September 26th, King and Donna Martz were only a few feet apart. They were able to confirm that Carolyn King had been in the lobby at the same time that, that Donna Martz was in the small dining area uh, having her continental breakfast. No one noticed Martz leaving the hotel with anyone, but investigators fear she has been kidnapped. Now they need to find out where the fugitives went next. Then, police discover Guy Goodman's car, abandoned outside Bismarck. There is no sign of Donna Martz. And the search reveals only receipts from stores along the suspect's route and several unused checks bearing Goodman's name. Once again, the suspects have left authorities with no leads. FBI Special Agent Craig Welkin knows they must find Martz before her kidnappers decide to kill her. Everybody in an investigation like this is extremely busy. Lots of information coming in, including information that really is extraneous, but you don't know that at the time. So there's a lot of sifting and sorting of information, um, a lot of trying to prioritize and make sure that your primary emphasis is in the right direction to recover the victim alive and well and apprehend the suspects. Sleepless hours pass with no leads. Then, a break. Working with Donna Martz's bank, detectives learn her credit card was used in a shopping mall more than 100 miles away. She had no relatives out there. There was just uh, absolutely no reason for her to go that way. The M.O. matches that of Goodman's killers. Mart's credit card started showing charges on it uh, a day or so after she had gone missing. We were fairly certain that uh, she was not the one doing the charges. The FBI dispatches teams to interview sales clerks at the mall. None of the clerks can positively identify Martin or King as the user of the card. But they are sure Martz did not make the purchases, which were for young men's clothing. When you're working the case, you become very much aware that the clock is working against you. Particularly when you have a situation like this where we know that Guy Goodman was murdered. The next significant lead comes when Martz's account posts a withdrawal in Montana. It occurred days earlier at an ATM in the small town of Shelby. Montana FBI agents bring the ATM surveillance tape to the command post in Bismarck. Detectives Wayman and Zekman positively identify Bradley Martin using Martz's credit card. It is the first definitive proof linking the suspects to Donna Martz. The tape confirms Martin and King traveled west, but there is still no sign of Martz. The evidence is building. Yet investigators' main concern is not prosecution, but finding Donna alive. And although we had an ideal that they were heading in a general direction of west, they could change that direction at any time, so it was very frustrating because we felt that there was a short time frame in which, if Donna March was still alive, that we would be able to apprehend them and save her. Special Agent Welkin knows they must speed up the process of tracking the victim's credit card usage. I contacted Ben Patty, a retired FBI special agent who was employed by a major credit card company issuing Donna March's card. At Visa's San Francisco headquarters, International Fraud Control Director Ben Patty agrees to help. Normally when a cardholder uses their credit card, that bank that issued the card will not see that transaction information for two to three days. That's when it's posted in the 
the bank would then know where the transaction occurred. Craig Welkin was really wanting to find out when the card that belonged to Donna Martz was used in real time, which we could not do with the systems as they were at that time. To locate the suspects the instant they used the card, Visa must create a complex reporting system for a single credit card. But Donna Mart's life is on the line. We contacted the systems people in the computer center and explained to them what we wanted. They said, okay, we'll go into our systems, make the necessary changes in the mainframe computer so that this specific cardholder number could be captured as it came through our systems. The programmers estimate it will take at least 24 hours to create and implement the new program. FBI agents hope that the computer program will finally put them closer to the murder suspects and to Donna Martz before she too is killed. The coroner for Lebanon County, Pennsylvania determined that retired florist Guy Goodman was savagely beaten and then slowly suffocated to death. His face was unrecognizable at the autopsy. The suspects, 21-year-old Bradley Martin and 27-year-old Carolyn King, have more than 20 felony convictions between them and are now fugitives on the run across the heartland of America. Authorities believe the couple is holding their latest victim, Donna Martz, captive and using her credit cards. The last charge was recorded in Montana. The FBI and police from across the country are in pursuit, tracking the suspects through the victim's credit card usage. Investigators remain one step behind. Led by Special Agent Craig Welkin. That was due to the flow of the information from the merchants to the credit card company, and then when that information was actually available from the computer database. In 1993, banking computers take days to post each transaction. Investigators await a new Visa program that will trap any activity on Martz's card. Pennsylvania detective Paul Zeckman chased the pair from the beginning of their flight. It was very frustrating being days behind locating places that Martz's credit card had been used because we knew that, number one, this couple had killed Guy Goodman. We knew that Donna Martz potentially was going to be the next victim. If she had not already been killed, there was nothing we could do uh, more than what we were doing to try and locate them and stop this from happening. Investigators try to estimate where the suspects will go next. They alert all law enforcement agencies on the suspect's possible routes. They post descriptions of the suspects in their vehicle in the National Crime Information Center's nationwide database. We entered both Bradley Martin and Carolyn King in NCIC. They were also entered in as kidnapping suspects. In addition to that, regional messages had gone out to all the police departments to be on the lookout for Donna Martz, Carolyn King, or Bradley Martin. If any police force in the country runs into the couple, the Bismarck Task Force will be notified. To further increase their chances, investigators fax descriptions of the suspects and the victim to police agencies along Martin and King's likely routes. But there are no incoming leads beyond the sporadic credit card purchases. Detectives Wayman and Zeckman returned to Pennsylvania to re-interview everyone who knows the fugitives. They hope Martin and King have made contact with someone back home. We continually talked to individuals in the Palmary area who were associates of Bradley Martin, trying to find out if there was recent contact with him or Carolyn King, and if there was, where were they at, where did they call from? But no one offers new information. 
Despite every effort, investigators still have nothing. The FBI receives an update from the Visa Corporation in San Francisco. There's Ben Patty, he's international. Visa fraud investigator and former special agent Ben Patty had asked the company's systems programmers for a way to trace Martz's credit card transactions as they are made. TZ? And I told the FBI, and we set up a system of contact between our systems people in Virginia, myself, and in the FBI and their command post. After the system was in place, the first transaction that came through was a service station gas transaction in Southern California. It was in Los Angeles several hours earlier. Investigators are closer, but still too far behind. While the task force notifies authorities in the LA area, Visa gets another hit on Donna Martz's card. The transaction came through our systems in real time. As soon as it came through the systems, we notified the FBI's command post, and it would have been within hour, two hour time that the transaction actually occurred. Then a transaction is made at a hotel in National City outside San Diego. Agents at the command post contact the FBI's San Diego field office. And the lead goes to Supervisory Special Agent Sam Stanton. We received information that, uh, that the Donna March credit card had been used at the hotel in National City. So immediately I dispatched agents over to the hotel off of Interstate 5. Agents interviewed the uh, manager and the security guard and employees at the hotel and was able to determine that uh, a couple matching uh, Martin and King had stayed at the hotel using Donna March's credit card. But the couple checked out two hours earlier, paying for the room with the visa. Police officers and FBI agents swarmed the area checking hotel parking lots, convenience stores, and gas stations for Donna Martz's Chrysler New Yorker or any sign of Martin and King. Special Agent Stanton knows finding the car is a long shot, especially when that car has a two-hour lead on authorities. Of course, San Diego is a very large city, and to try to find a, a vehicle in a city that size would be almost impossible. But we did put out an all-points bulletin and notified the uh, state judicial police and the federal police in Mexico and the Border Patrol, uh, thinking that maybe the individuals were headed toward Mexico. The Tijuana border is the busiest in the world. In 1993, Nearly 40,000 Americans cross into Mexico every day without having to show even an ID. If the fugitives make it past the border, it is unlikely they will ever be found. All right. I know it's been a couple of days, but have you heard from Brad or Carolyn? Well... Then, the Pennsylvania detectives finally catch a break that narrows the search. What do you have to say? According to Chief Michael Wayman. We received information from a, an associate of Bradley Martin's indicating that they had received a phone call from Bradley and that Bradley was in San Diego, that he was with Carolyn King, and that they were headed back towards Pennsylvania. Uh, we took that information. We notified the San Diego office of the FBI, and they in turn notified the California Highway Patrol. The fugitives made the call as they checked out of the hotel in San Diego. Martin and King still have a two-hour lead, but authorities continue closing the gap. Soon a hunch and a bit of luck will bring the investigation to a violent and dangerous conclusion. Fall 1993, authorities chase Bradley Martin and Carolyn King, suspected of murder in Pennsylvania and kidnapping in North Dakota. 
Investigators from both states are frustrated that for weeks they have been one step behind the suspects. They hope to find the pair before the abducted woman, Donna Martz, is killed. Then a new program created by the Visa Corporation at the FBI's request puts investigators only two hours behind the suspects. Investigators learn the two have just checked out of a San Diego area hotel. Based on their checkout time and the tip that the fugitives are heading east, FBI agents try to estimate their position. Special Agent Stanton has a hunch that the suspects will use Interstate 8, the southernmost highway going east. He determines that Martin and King will soon be approaching El Centro, California, near the Arizona border. I called Agent Paul Vick in the El Centro office of the FBI and asked him to send out an all-points bulletin. Stanton hopes he has picked the right route as El Centro Special Agent Paul Vick takes it from there. I called the California Highway Patrol dispatchers and asked them to broadcast the Martz's car description. I wanted for murder. They just left uh, a hotel in San Diego, and we suspect they might be headed east on Interstate 8. We need them stopped. The All Points Bulletin, about 187 suspects, police code for murder, is transmitted to every officer on Interstate 8, including California Highway Patrolman Richard Chambers. CHP unit, Cal Central Contendering. I sent by copy uh, information on 187 suspects possibly en route to uh, Cal Central. I went and checked my section of the freeway like I normally would on my, in the beginning of my shift, and uh, I went west on Interstate 8. As Chambers drives, he receives the suspect's descriptions. First suspect is a Bradley Martin, white male, six foot, 160. Second subject is a Carolyn King, black female, wanted by the FBI. Within minutes, Chambers believes he has spotted the car. I was driving west on the freeway through the desert, and there's not that much traffic. I saw the car go by eastbound, and I believed it matched the description. But Chambers cannot see the car's license plate. I wasn't sure, so I made a U-turn through the center divider and uh, overtook the vehicle and verified the license plate. And it was, in fact, uh, bearing the North Dakota license plate that we had received. Well, Central 116 84, I think I'm behind the 187 vehicle. Could you send me back a car? Dispatch advises Officer Chambers that there is no backup immediately available. Only one unmarked unit races to catch up to the suspects. That's Sergeant Riley from responding to the pursuit. Joining uh, pursuit. At Police know the suspects are desperate and probably are. Two suspects of black female driving. Uh, we'll tip the contact at DPS. That's where they know I'm behind them at 60 miles an hour coming up on 186. Tip for uh, 60 miles per hour coming up on 186. But so far, the suspects appear calm as they approach State Route 186. Of course, they're going to head up south on a 186 where it looks. They're getting off 186. Just for southbound on 186. Chambers' backup is still several miles behind, racing to catch up. On Route 186, the chase intensifies. Not stopping, the curve to accelerate to 70. The suspects try to shake Officer Chambers, but he maintains pursuit, even as they escalate to 90 miles an hour. Oh. 
The suspects cross into Arizona with Chambers on their heels. Although a California officer outside of his jurisdiction, Chambers continues his pursuit. He relays information to Arizona authorities. Then, the danger increases. The male passenger did come out of the uh, right front window with a handgun. They're shooting. They are shooting. Sound like they're shooting. Chambers stays on them, intent to capture the deadly suspects. As the cars speed toward the town of Yuma, Arizona, dozens of officers listening in race to cover Chambers. October 5th, 1993. California Highway Patrol Officer Richard Chambers engages in a high-speed chase with murder and kidnapping suspects Carolyn King and Bradley Martin. Near El Centro, California, the pursuit crosses into Arizona. Backup is responding. But as the suspects barrel toward the town of Yuma, Arizona, Officer Chambers is on his own and under fire. He knows he must capture the pair before they kill again. The suspects exit onto a smaller road, this one with intersections. Chambers radios their position. They're going into Yuma now. Get my units out there, back them up. They run through two stop signs without incident. Then. When they crash, the suspects flee on foot. I got out of my car and drew my, uh, my pistol and ordered them to stop. And I, I told them if they didn't stop, I'd shoot. And at that time, the female did stop. Then, Carolyn King orders Martin to stop. And I was able to handcuff the female. I just had one pair of handcuffs with me at the time, and uh, I held the male passenger at gunpoint until uh, Yuma PD arrived. It was probably only a minute or two, but it seemed longer than that. When the backup officer arrives, he helps take the suspects into custody. Put your hands behind your back. After a two-week cross-country flight pursued by police and the FBI, Carolyn King and Bradley Martin have finally been stopped. But investigators' first concern is the safety of the kidnapped woman, Donna Martz. She is not inside the car. On the floorboards lies the handgun Martin fired at Chambers. They open the trunk. Inside, police find duct tape, a knife, and Donna Martz's glasses. But nothing indicating where she is. Martin and King are taken to the Yuma Police Department, but they refuse to tell officers what happened to the kidnapped woman. FBI agents arrive and interrogate the suspects separately. The one Carolyn King is defiant from the start, refusing even to admit her real identity. She claims no knowledge of Donna Martz. Another agent is unsuccessful with Bradley Martin as well. When Special Agent Paul Vick reaches the station, he learns that Martin has refused to talk. Bradley Martin was pacing back and forth with his hands handcuffed behind him. He appeared to be in some kind of discomfort. Vic decides to try another approach. 
Martin told me that his neck hurt and he had pain extending down into his right arm. Hoping to win Martin over and get him to cooperate, Vic offers to recuff him in front so he will be more comfortable. His strategy works. Martin told me that he would speak with me. The agent reminds Martin he had earlier invoked his right to an attorney, but the suspect says he is now waiving that right. Vic drafts a statement to ensure Martin's waiver will hold up in court. Once he agreed to that, he signed this piece of paper that I wrote out that he agreed to talk to me, even though he had invoked earlier. After he signed that document, I looked him straight in the eyes and I told him that I knew that he killed somebody in Pennsylvania, but that I wanted to know that Martz was okay. And then I told him, is she okay? And Martin looked at me and he told me, no, I killed her. Martin says they kept Mrs. Martz for over a week. But after several close calls with police, he decided to get rid of her. They stopped in the Nevada desert. He got her out of the trunk and walked her to a ditch at gunpoint. He says she knew he was going to kill her. She said one thing before he fired, that she loved her children. The news devastates everyone who had hoped to save Donna. At the conclusion of the interview with Martin, we obtained a map which showed approximately where Martz could be located in Nevada. And we then faxed the map to the Elko, Nevada FBI office, at which time, late at night, a search was initiated to look for Donna Martz's body. But Martin was doing drugs during his fugitive trek. His memory is unclear and his map inaccurate. Several times during the night, search crews call in for more information. The desert area near Elko, Nevada is hundreds of square miles. The crews do their best searching through the night and into the morning. Then, on October 7th, investigators find the body of Donna Martz about a mile and a half off Interstate 80. In a case like the Guy Goodman, Donna Martz homicides, the drive is to keep anyone else from getting hurt. Secondly, it's solving the case, get them off the street and into jail, and then successfully prosecute them. In Nevada, Martin and King plead guilty to the kidnapping and murder of Donna Martz and receive life sentences. In Pennsylvania, they are found guilty of the murder of Guy Goodman. Both Martin and King are sentenced to death. This case is an excellent example which showed the interagency cooperation between the FBI and local county and state officials uh, in California, Arizona, North Dakota, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and numerous other states. From working together, we were able to solve this case and apprehend King and Martin and get them convicted. For Donna Martz's 11 grandchildren, three children, family, and friends, the convictions bring a sense of closure. Even today, they are comforted in knowing police and the FBI caught Martin and King before they could claim yet another victim.